Yeah, we're not done. There's still more basics to cover. Oh, oh sorry. We're just talking. Um, yeah, so we're not done yet. There's more to cover on root locus. I'm going to cover two more items today. Um, there's six in total, and or five, maybe five or six. Anyway, the things you have to remember, it doesn't matter how many there are, you have to understand how it works. So we cover when we're drawing the root locus, the number of branches is the close loop poles, and where to start and to end. There's a few other things that we have to remember about the root locus, and one is that it will be symmetrical. So it has symmetry about the real axis. axis. So this is another thing you have to remember when drawing. And this kind of makes sense if you think about before whenever we would get poles that come up in the S plane here, they always come in conjugate pairs, right? So we usually get some poles here or here. And you know, maybe they're, they're always reflected across the real axis. And the reason that this happens is because all the systems that we model are real systems. So they have usually real uh, components to them. So for example, you might have one or s squared plus one, or so we, this could be your g of s, h of s. Now maybe it has you can have, this would be an imaginary component. You can also have um, something with three components in it. So like uh, s squared plus 3s plus 17, something. You're going to have some complex poles. But they're always going to come in pairs. So if these did not come in pairs, so say we had one there and one here. So you have a real one and you just have one hanging out over here. When you put them into these values, you would find that the, you would have to, have to have complex components as one of these coefficients. Because we're working with real systems and we don't have complex components here, they have to come in conjugate pairs. So that's true with all the poles, right? So as you vary k here, your k value as you vary, vary k, your poles will also move in conjugate pairs. And for example, I'll draw a picture here. Say you had, say you were actually starting from here, and you they were going to move with k. If this one starts to move this way, say towards the real axis, the other one would have to follow it exactly. So you can always remember that there's symmetry across the uh, real axis here, so you reflect it this way, it has to be exactly the same. So if you solve for one on the top, then you know the bottom half as well. So that's one aspect, is you have to have symmetry. And the next point so our second point for this video is that it's a little bit complicated, on the real axis Say on real axis, the root locus exists to the left of an odd number of poles or zeros, the open loop poles or zeros. So we're going to write it and then we'll try to explain it. So uh, on the real axis, the root locus, I'm just going to write RL, exists to left of open loop OL, open loop poles slash zeros. So let's explain what this is. Okay, so the mechanic of it is, say you have a bunch of, we're only looking at the real axis now, so we can ignore the imaginary components. Say we have a x and an x and a zero, and I'm going to put another zero here. So pretty much it, what it means is on the real axis, so we start from the left. Oh, and the other constraint of this is, this is assuming that k is, when we're looking at k, uh, greater than zero. So if you were to actually look at negative values of k, then it would be the opposite. But because we're looking at only k greater than zero, like we stated before, that's a root locus definition, um, then it follows the 
this rule, it's on, on the left. So we kind of move from this side. So this is one, if there's one pole or zero, and so that's an odd number. And so we know that the root locus must exist on this side. Actually, I'll draw it with green to make it a little clearer. So the root locus exists from here until we hit our second pole, so our second pole or zero. So now we've hit this one, so it would go technically to the center of it. Now we've hit the zero. Now there's two of them, that's an even number, so it doesn't exist on this side. There's no root locus path here. This is the third one, an odd number, so it actually exists on this side until we hit our next pole, and over here there's four, so four to the right of this point, so the root locus does not exist there. Okay, so that's how you figure it out. And to explain it, we're going to go back to our, our angle argument. So the angle of G of S, H of S, remember this is our, our whatever values in here multiplied by our K value, that one has to equal 180 degrees, which is equal to a negative 180 and the 2 pi multiple of that, or 360 since we're in degrees. But anyway, it has to equal that value. And if you remember before, we talked about how if we pick a point, say we want to evaluate this point out here, I'm going to draw it further so we can evaluate it. This is our test point. Then we can draw a line, so draw a vector from this test point to each of our poles, poles and zeros, open loop poles and zeros, and then figure out the angle from that. And remember, it would be the angle of the see, zeros of, I'm just going to say GH here, so the zeros of this expression divided by the poles, the angle of this, all the poles of GH, so this. Okay, so if we take this point and we draw these values, so on the real axis, right, we draw one vector here, and it's going to be hard because they're kind of on top of each other here, but one vector here, we see that these are the two poles, and the angle that we draw from this point to there, the vector is going to be 180, or sorry, zero degrees. It's pointing in the zero. Multiply them together, it'll still be zero. So the poles here, in this example, we would have the angle for the, this test point to each of the poles being zero degrees. Okay, and simple to see, the zeros, the vector from here to the zeros, which are also on the same plane, would also be zero. So we see right away, if we divide these, we subtract them, but they're both zero. So our overall degree here would be zero. That does not match 180. So anything here, right, and no matter which test you point you pick over here, as they go to the, these other points, they're going to be zero. If we take a test point in here, the only thing we're changing is the sign or the direction of this one vector. So now we have one pole pointing to negative 180, or positive 180, and one, the other one, pointing here. So what we, all that does is that changes the degrees here in our pole, 180 degrees. Now when we subtract, we get negative 180, which is the same as positive, so it matches this. So you can see that for each of these, all every single point here between these two, you'll have it will match this value. So it satisfies the angle constraint. And so you can to do it for yourself, take a test point here and test point here, and you'll see. And we discussed last time in the other video that if we go off a little bit from this, these angles will not match up, and so it has to be constrained to the um, axis here. There's one more question you might ask. I'll see if I can explain it. So say we add, now I'm just going to theoretically add, so we're going to add some poles up here. So say we actually had some poles here. And I'll say instead of these, right, so we have to match the number of zeros and poles as much as we can. Okay, so for example, let's say, and actually this changes our root locus now, 
right, so here's a new setup. We have some conjugate poles. And actually, let's, let's move this out further just so we don't get confused so everything's very clear. Okay, so here's our, these are our zeros, and here are our conjugate poles. Okay, so by this, this method, we would see that on the real axis, it's left of the odd number. So this is one, so it's left of this. And once we hit this one, we hit two, so nothing exists over here. So let's take a test point one more time with, let's take this test point again. And now we're going to draw, we drew the, draw these vectors here, right, to the zero. So that's still zero degrees. Now let's draw these vectors here. So we draw them here. And they will have some value, right? So this will have some angle here, this vector. So we're going to call it theta 1. Actually, we just call it theta because there's not going to be a theta 2. So this will be positive theta, and this will be negative theta, right? So if we take that now and we add them up, so we have within here, we would get the angle theta 1, theta positive, and we multiply it by this vector, but when we multiply them vectors, we just add the angles, right? So then we have negative theta. When we add those together, we know that this will be zero. Zero degrees, right? So it actually doesn't add anything to our, now we still have zero over zero again, which we know is not a valid point. So this would be zero degrees, not a valid point. We can do the same exercise over here, we'll see the same thing. So pretty much the conjugate pairs always add up to zero. I just ran out of video, so, so sorry to be cut off in the middle of what I was saying, but the conjugate pairs here will always add up to zero. So, right, they're usually they're the same, either the poles or the zeros. And when we add them together, so we have gamma, gamma here, I think I was actually in the middle of doing this, so we'll finish that. Um, the, so if we look at this point, right, so I'm just going to finish this calculation out and we're going to, we'll just do it again. <laughs> so looking at this as our test point one more time and we look at first the zeros. So from this test point to our zeros, which are these points, right, we have one in the positive direction, one in the negative. So the total sum would be 180 degrees because you multiply them together. This one's zero. Zero plus the angle of the other one, which is 180, 180. Okay, so now we do the same thing with this conjugate pairs to our poles. And we see that we have to add the angle, the gamma here. And we add, add the angles, we're multiplying the vectors, adding the angles, negative gamma, and that, of course, will be zero. So again, here, we get 180 degrees. So, you can also think of it as, it's the same rules, just that the conjugate pairs add a zero when we add them up like this. So they negate themselves, and so really you're still doing the same basic comp computation that we're doing when we just were looking at the real axis. So I hope that proves that when we are looking just at the real axis numbers, that we can just draw the root locus to the left of the odd numbers of poles and zeros, the open loop poles and zeros. So here in this case we had, we're going to just draw, we had our zeros here, zero here, we had some conjugate poles out here. The x path, so on the real axis, the path would go simply here, between these two points. And that's not the end of the root locus. Uh, you'd actually have some sort of, if it were this one, these conjugate pairs would we have to connect them, right? Because our starting point is the x's. So and I have to think about it as, so Valerie is controlling our k value, right? So she starts at a certain point. So she starts at this x, and she is going to travel to one of the poles here. So you can draw the root locus, and she'll follow that path until it gets to the end point, which is one of the poles. So we're not quite done yet. We're going to do one more video on how to uh, deal with, we're going to do some examples and then do one more, one more rule I haven't talked about yet.
Um, but just to review with these basic ones, so we'll do an example. The number of branches is the number of poles. You start at the poles, end at the zeros of the open loop system, so that's this dh. And the symmetry is about the real axis, so it has to be reflected across the real axis. And on the real axis, you can automatically draw where the root locus exists because it will be left of an odd number of poles or zeros. Right, so we'll do some examples with these and hopefully that will help explain it. 